uh, I have a great pleasure to welcome you to all to this event uh, and talk by Ion Weisman from Forensic Architecture. Uh, I'm Jussi Koitala, Head of Program at Frame Contemporary Art Finland. Uh, I have a round glasses, white skin, quite, quite, uh, quite uh, light uh, hair and black t-shirt on me. In the background of me there is a shelf, bookshelf with a lot of books. I'm currently at the Frame Contemporary Art Finland's office. Uh, so this event uh, is part of gathering for rehearsing hospitalities autumn 2021 program, an online and offsite program that runs from 8 until 11th of September. So today is the last day. Uh, and it's part of the rehearsing hospitalities uh, frames uh, public program from 2019 to 2023. And this edition especially is, um, is co-organized by FRAME, Finnish Museum of Architecture and Vanta Art Museum Artsi and produced in collaboration with additional partners from Finnish Culture Institute New York and Ihme Helsinki. And this talk is specially co-organized with Finnish Museum of Architecture and Ihme Helsinki. Uh, and the program this year bridges between hospitality or questions of hospitality, access, with matters of security and safety. Hospitality, care, safety and security are matters intrinsically entangled, not simply through their definitions or and overlapping meanings, but as acts, practices, institutions, industries, infrastructures and such systems of power. The field of curation has given much attention to thinking with and, pra and practicing matters of hospitality and care after all, these are foundational aspects of curating and maybe art, say, art scene and culture scene in general. Security and safety have also long been present in museums and art institutions, perhaps less in the form of critical discourse and more for the protection of objects and infrastructures. But for who and for what security is offered in arts and culture? These are some of the questions what we've been asking when we've been planning the uh, event. Should we, and the whole program, should we become more hospitable and caring towards matters of security and safety? How might we deal with the weight of this accountability and responsibility in artistic and curatorial practices? Uh, so the uh, event uh, has um, introductions in the beginning uh, and then talk by Ian Weisman and then opening up the uh, conversation um, in the end. And this is moderated by Bassam Al Baroni, uh, who will be introduced later also. Uh, and I hope that there's going to be um, uh, questions and comments that you can post in the chat later and then will be addressed in the end of the event. Um, uh, uh, we can um, post the timetable of the program in the chat too soon, so you can see it in the whole time. Um, so, um, yes, uh, maybe I will just say a few technicalities here and then I will give you also a uh, stage for for our partners who has been organizing this talk with us from Ihme Helsinki and Finnish Architecture Museum. Just kind of quickly, so go, uh, there is, um, this is event, event is recorded and stays in the Frames YouTube channel uh, afterwards. Uh, Eri Välikangas and Aiden Luosujärvi are doing captioning for this, so, so you can uh, switch the live tra transcription on if you are if need that. Uh, and then Anse, we have also Anse Pratus and Reishat Kaili behind the scenes doing the technical uh, things. Um, and Frame is also uh, having this uh, want to support safer participation and safer space, online space um, in, this, in, in our events. Uh, so this is also based in the instructions are based on the on the chat so we can see them. 
Um, maybe I would like to then ask Paula Toppila from Ihme Helsinki to give a little bit like short introduction how how Ihme Helsinki is is uh, relating to the talk and and the uh, whole context. Thank you, Paula. Uh, thank you, Jussi. Hello, everybody. Greetings from Ihme Helsinki. That is a contemporary art commissioning agency bringing together art, science and climate work. Uh, Ihme Helsinki and myself as the director and curator of the organization, we are very happy to be involved in this event as one of the collaborators. Our main concern is to explore how to exist as a contemporary art organization and how to create meaningful discourse in the age of climate crisis and biodiversity loss. And forensic architecture for us, uh, led by today's guest speaker, Eyal Weisman, is a major social and political player in the international field of contemporary art. The group uses multidisciplinary methods to produce, interpret and display research material on violence, human rights violations and environmental destruction in art and other contexts as well. Uh, forensic architecture's focus is on events in the public realm. For example, on a question how to challenge understanding of public space from the perspective of violence, politics and security. Public, public space is also at the heart of Ihme Helsinki's operations as our annual commissions take place in the public. And forensic architecture's work, and I'm sure A.L. Weisman's speech today, will bring social and political depth to this debate. Uh, I would like to thank Frame and Museum of Architecture for your collaboration, and also Eya in particular for taking the time to join us today. And to finish, I would like to wish everyone an inspiring day. Thank you. Yeah, let's then uh, Maria from Architecture Museum. The stage is yours. It'd be nice to hear from your perspective. Yes, thank you, Jussi, and thank you also, Paula, and uh, welcome everyone on my behalf. Greetings also from the Museum of Finnish Architecture. On behalf of the museum, I also want to express how glad we are to take part in this joint program together with Frame Finland, Ihme Helsinki and Vanta Art Museum Arti. And we are really much looking forward to A.L. Weisman's talk. Uh, for those listeners or readers present today who are located in Helsinki or nearby, I want to remind that forensic architecture's investigation, outsourcing risk, Ali Enterprises factory fire, is on display in the Architecture Museum studio until 24th of October. Uh, as a national or the national special museum in architecture in Finland, we are honored to have both today's talk and the studio display in our autumn program as as we recognize that A.L. Weisman and forensic architecture are in their human rights centered work developing new groundbreaking answers to the question of what architecture can do. Thank you. Thank you, Maria and Paula. Uh, now, I have a pleasure to uh, introduce our moderator today, uh, Professor uh, uh, Passam and Paloni is an assistant professor in curating at, at the School of Arts and Design and Architecture in Aalto University, Finland. Recent curatorial projects include uh, Infra Ontologies at Edith Ross House for Media Art, Oldenburg, Germany. Some previous curatorial highlights include Manif Manifesta 8 in Murcia, Spain, and Eva International uh, in Ireland, Spain, 2010 excuse me, 2014, <laughs> homeworks at, the, at uh, seven in Peru, 2015. Passam is an author of various essays on artist and art and curating, co-editor of Manual for Future Dis Dessert, 
and editor of Between Material and Possible Infrastructural Re-Examination -exam, re and Speculation in Art, which is forthcoming from the Stemper Press. Thanks, Basam, for joining us and moderating the talk today. Thank you, Yusi. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I will um, introduce Eyal uh, so he can start his talk. Uh, Eyal Weisman is the founding director of Forensic Architecture and professor of spatial and visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London. The author of over 15 books, he has held positions in many universities worldwide, including Princeton, ETH Zurich, and the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. He is a member of the Technology Advisory Board of the International Criminal Court and the Center for Investigative Journalism. In 2019, he was elected Life Fellow of the British Academy uh, and appointed member of the Order of the British Empire, MBE in the 2020 New Year's Honours for service, Services to Architecture. Uh, very happy to have Eyal today, uh, and uh, we can start the uh, talk. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you um, please indicate to me if you cannot see me or hear me. I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking to you in this forum. And then particularly uh, on this day, the 11th of September, 2021, 20 years after the events that to a large extent created the kind of neo-colonial environment, political environment, that forensic architecture responded to. An event that ignited a lot of processes, uh, particularly in the area where I come from. Uh, I'm born in Israel and evolved in the anti-colonial and human rights movement in Israel, Palestine, uh, and in the larger region. Uh, of what is what used to be called the Middle East. Forensic architecture uh, is 10 years around, um, uh, began around 2011. When we started forensic architecture, a program that emerged really out of uh, Goldsmiths, University of London, where Bassam and I uh, first met, uh, it came out of a certain experiment, thinking, can we use our um, critical uh, theory education? Can we use our, you know, thinking about politics and aesthetics? Could we think about our mining and, and of contemporary culture, visual cultures, and actually make them effective in a world in which um, the work of an artist, we believe, of an architect as myself, uh, of you know, other aesthetic practitioners, curators, writers, academics, etc., is not only to comment upon culture, but to actually find a way to intervene uh, within it. And that is really the, the kind of the essence of, of the work that I'd like to be sharing with you today and the kind of thinking that goes uh, around it. I actually uh, arranged the lecture in a, in, in a way that start from our starting point. And I think that initially the term counter investigations or counter forensics uh, is essential to understand the work of forensic architecture. So, you know, we've, you, you've heard in the introduction that we are a multidisciplinary group of uh, many uh, types of practitioners. What is very important 
is that we are not using policing techniques uh, or police work. What we do is counter investigation. That means investigating the investigators, investigating those people that otherwise have monopoly over investigations, uh, or indeed those agencies, militaries, secret services, um, large corporations that destroy environments, police forces for their actions. We actually want to invert the forensic case and investigate those, uh, those practitioners. Uh, indeed, when we first came up with the idea, we thought of ourselves as archaeologists, as people that would investigate the destroyed building. Here on the right, you see one of our colleagues, Caroline Sturdy calls, looking at a scan of a, of a building, just like a pathologist investigates a body. As you see here on the left, Clyde Snow, one of the great, greatest pathologists of the 20th century. But we soon realized that the task that we're facing in the kind of world that we were forced to inhabit post 9-11, is one in which the architectural fact, the architectural ruin will, was always mediated through photography and other modes of representation, videos, etc. And that what we need to analyze is not only the architecture, but the media in which it is captured. And when you analyze a building through the media in which it is captured, you need to understand the limitation of that media. In the post 9-11 world, imperial forces, neo-colonial forces like the US and like Israel here in a photograph in Gaza, were coming up with a new, uh, not, not new concept because assassinations were you know, tools, political tools since a long time, but drone strikes, the killing of um, people that um, the CIA or the Israeli army was thinking needed to die uh, with, uh, drone mis with drone missiles, with kind of like missiles fired from drones. And the signature that was left in buildings was always a hole in the roof. Death would come through the roof the missile would enter through the roof and would blast inside, killing whoever inhabits the space under that hole in the roof. So increasingly in Gaza, we were seeing buildings with this signature, this hole in the roof. And the analysis at the time was undertaken through satellite imagery. There's a problem with satellite images. Firstly, many problems with satellite images with the view from above that they offer. But the problem is really in the very nature also of the media. Satellite images then, and almost now, um, very little has changed, are divided into pixels, each one representing 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters on the ground. The whole of the missile, that the missile leaves in the roof, is smaller. And therefore, while looking at a building from above that we know that targeted assassination happened in, this building is in Miran Shah, we don't know, we cannot see the hole in the roof. It is under what I called the threshold of detectability of that missile. So doing forensic architecture is at the same time analyzing the people, or the, concept, the, the situation in which people are assassinated, the building in which they died, and the media that captures that crime. It is always an investigation of media and architecture at the same time. And we were asking ourselves, why is this satellite image divided into 50 by 50 centimeters? And understood it's something like a modular, 
satellite image providers, commercials, do not want to capture people on roofs, say, because they would have privacy issues. So they pixelated their image. Optically, you can see much sharper, 50 to 50, basically to stamp people out of images. But by doing that, also stamp people out of, um, uh, uh, of you know, ana analysis of, uh, of what has happened. So while the CIA could see a picture like that, with um, seeing actually people on the ground, civil society investigators, counter investigators would see only a pixel. The crime is erased by the means of its representation. And this, the hole in the roof is smaller than 50 by 50. Uh, on almost 10 years ago, uh, the first filmed documentation of uh, the consequence of a drone strike was um, broadcast in NBC News. It was a rather big scoop. Uh, and um, they, uh, for the first time, we did not know where it is, that building. Um, that, that video had to, not, not like today, things are uploaded onto the internet, we capture them from different social media websites. Uh, they were uh, uploaded on, um, and it had, it had physically to move. So Waziristan, the part of Afghanistan, where the Taliban retreated to when the Americans and led coalition occupied Afghanistan. So Taliban retreated across the border to Pakistan. The um, CIA was assassinating Taliban leaders and other leaders uh, in cities along Waziristan. Waziristan was put itself under siege. No camera could go in, no camera could go out. So this is why it was a big scoop. Uh, that piece of footage had to pass six hands from one person to the next, to the next, to the next, until it arrived in Islamabad. And at that moment could be broadcast publicly. And um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the um, video that we have uh, undertaken. We've been looking at the at the way at the rubble. We're seeing a city. We're seeing all sort of ruin. We don't know if that ruin is from drone strike or not. Um, nothing is distinct. Can we actually find? anything about the videographer or the picture. Initially, you know, when you see so much of the photographic frame hidden by the window frame, you go like, that's dead information. No, it's only in shadow. But the fact allowed us to understand that the person is filming from inside the room. That is to say, the person is still scared of being seen filming, whether it is from a double tap, you know, of kind of drone still above and would um, shoot again at whoever is filming, or whether that person is scared of people on the ground, we do not know. But it shows you a moment in which filming anything, filming evidence is precarious. And when somebody is sending you something that risks their lives to do that video. It is absolutely essential to look at it carefully because if somebody risks their life to provide you that thing, you need to look at every frame in this video and see what is the message that is encoded in it. Here you have the direction of the shadow. We know we're looking northwards. We can open a panorama. We can identify various types of um, features, a turning in the road, a certain widening of the road on the other side. Um, and uh, we can try to look, and we were spending days and days and days looking through um, until we found one place in the, you know, the northward orientation, the tower, etc., that could be that particular place. The first video of a drone strike, we needed to actually show, can we get to a human representation of what has happened there? There were videos inside that room, 
the person is is filming the hole in the roof the famous hole in the roof is here of course the grid that i told you about uh, before um and capturing the shrapnel we create a panorama of that video uh, we can start looking very very carefully at the wall and mark all the chipping on the wall in this shrapnel so that we could maybe reveal to us something every chipping on the wall is being marked and then we see that one part of this room has got no chipping on the wall and we created kind of an understanding that this is the place where people die because if people if the if the, if a bomb exploded in that room if a bomb exploded in that room obviously their bodies would 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 capture that so it's the shadow it's the shadow of the blast the human representation is inscribed on the architecture and the architecture walls operate more or less like a negative in a film we could even calculate the exact point where the bomb blasted and build a model um, that model i'll show you later has been enabled to us and here for the first relation between forensic architecture and art and cultural spaces is that they enabled the Venice Biennale Commission enabled us to build that model that allowed us to investigate and to identify the exact missile that the CIA was using to it. So you draw the body, you understand the missile. And the Americans were saying that missile is like a lesser evil because it's like a poison dart that can kill few people and minimize collateral harm. But as with the paradox of the lesser evil, if you, if you have a tool that you believe is precise and minimal, you would use it again and you'd use it again and use it again and use it again. And part of those kind of until, you know, all across Waziristan, the sieged up area, you would have hundreds of strikes and thousands of casualties arrive at cumulatively. Um, so here you could see at certain point um, the way in which art and cultural spaces enabled us to undertake that. That investigation was actually um, featured one of the first investigations we've done, in fact, our first, very first video was featured in a presentation by the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the UN General Assembly in an attempt to confront the US and CIA um, illegal uh, drone strikes or extrajudicial assassinations. So you see a piece of work that bridges between, you know, the Venice Biennale of Architecture and the UN General Assembly. The next uh, project I want to show you is really taking you, taking us back to the place I come from, Palestine, Israel. And um, the, as I said before, I kind of developed intellectually and politically the anti-colonial movement. And they, you know, when we speak about Israeli colonialism, we do not really speak only about the occupation of the West Bank, uh, Jerusalem, and Gaza. We speak also about areas within uh, what is called Israel proper, 48 Palestine. And uh, one of those uh, frontiers of displacement uh, is the Nakab Desert, Negev in English, uh, when um, uh, Israeli forces are, are continuously evicting uh, Bedouin Palestinian inhabitants of that part. Uh, Israeli authorities do not recognize Bedouin uh, Palestinian to be entitled to land. They said, well, you're Bedouins. That means you're nomads. If you're nomads, you don't have a right of property uh, and continuously displace them. And here is one such um, 
night, night raid on a Bedouin Palestinian village called Um al Khiran in the Nakab. And you see Israeli forces, police entering the We're working for many years with this Palestinian same community. We're in London, we were receiving. Wants to demolish There is a member of parliament, the Until at some point, we hear gunshots. Okay, okay, okay. Did you hear? Okay. Stop, stop, stop. Three shots. Four shots, uh, etc. At this moment, uh, the videographer that shoots this video, her name is Karen Mano, uh, hears the gunshot and takes cover. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Sorry, somebody was speaking to me in the. Okay, I'll continue. Um, uh, after the shots, she switches off the camera. When she switches the camera back on, she starts hearing the, a car horn. And they understand that somebody was shot in the car. People are trying to get into the car. They're being pushed continuously by the police. They try to navigate, they try to get into the car. Nobody knows where things are. Here in a, after that, we have created a model. You could see an architectural model is here, allow us to navigate a space that is otherwise invisible, just lights at night. And the model is actually uh, creating a kind of uh, a mode of it allows because a kind of container of the video, video production, stretch on around it. So we can see what is happening. And we cannot see the car that um, although they could not see the car, where the car horn was beeping continuously, in that car, as the car horn was beeping, uh, there was a man, uh, a teacher, Yakub Musa Abul Kian, that was bleeding to death within that vehicle. Um, in the morning, the Israeli police and the Israeli media claimed that he was shot because he was a terrorist that he tried to run over, or he did succeed, in fact, in running over a police officer. And then they had to um, effectively um, uh, kill him in response to his terror attack. Um, so this is the head of the Communist Party, Ayman Ode, who was trying to help, was trying to get into the car honk and was beaten uh, seriously by the police and his head was wounded. Our prime minister then um, on Facebook the next morning says it was a terror attack. And not only is it a terror attack, but he wants to now retaliate against the Bedouin Palestinians. He said, these are terrorists, we're gonna deny their citizenship. So you can see another very important principle of our work. We take cases where uh, a, a micro incident, a split second incident has long political or ignite long political processes uh, within that. The head of the police, the minister in charge of the police says the Palestinian political leadership incited it. He says to Ayman Ode, who we saw with the wounded head, the blood is on your in on your hands, meaning you're guilty of that uh, incident. Although we saw the blood was in his head, rather. Uh, and then the police makes their first mistake. 
Uh, during that day, they released a thermal imaging video. And they said various things. They said, look, you know, here is the, the vehicle of Yakub Musa Kian. Let us show you how it happened. So I said, this is the terrorist vehicle. Uh, and he's driving slowly with his lights turned off. How do we know the lights are turned off? They say it's turned off. This is the group of policemen. And now he's charging into the police officers. And indeed, that, sorry, that looks like, yeah, like he's trying to run over uh, police officers. And they said, okay, this justifies uh, our killing of this man. However, um, we, the minute the first evidence leaked, you need to understand when you do counter forensics, you're not like the police. You don't have control. You cannot cordon off an area and, and look at the evidence. You need to wait till something gives, something arrives. So we have Karen Manor video, which basically records darks and light, but it hears. We hear the gunshot. So we have a soundtrack. Then we have the police video, which sees into the dark, but it doesn't hear. Something here, something see. Let's sync them up together and see what they tell us. In fact, uh, by putting, I start seeing something very interesting. The shots were fired before the car actually accelerated towards the resources. Okay, putting sound over the image allow us to uh, actually understand this thing. And then obviously we see only after that, do we see the, the, the car going towards the police officers. So here, you know, like the, the police story uh, becomes mm, shaky. Um, you know, usually if you conduct police investigation, you do you say it's ongoing investigation, you release it all together. When you do counter investigation, you need to release information as you go along uh, in order to uh, intervene in a situation. So we post uh, online um, uh, a video showing um, our, you know, the, the, the right order. Um, let's get um, re retweeted by the head of the Communist Party, who is also kind of, you know, close to us, friend of ours. Um, and, uh, sorry, can, can I ask that somebody else admits that the people that come in, it's, it's instructed to me, if there is a co-host, uh, you can do that. Um, and so the, the, the head of the communist party, uh, tweets our, our account, the police itself respond and says, kind of fake news us. They said, we manipulated the edit, uh, we distorted the evidence. Uh, the ban is a terrorist, etc. But still, when one thing is released, it mobilizes others. Uh, and, you know, a conscientious pathologist actually leaks the report, the pathology report on the teacher, on Yakub Musa Bulkian, and sees that his knee uh, was wounded. Sorry, can somebody else admit the people? Thank you. Um, and, um, and can actually... Uh, we understand that he hasn't had control over his leg. So the, the state is now starting to be under pressure. And now it's the minister in charge of the police in the Knesset, the parliament, uh, responding in that way. He says, I'll continue to tell the truth. I, the truth is that Yakub Musa Bulkian is a terrorist, despite there being members of the left, I suppose us and others, that won't like it. No one would silence me. You could see a very powerful state, a very powerful minister, speaking from a kind of minoritarian but no one will silence me as if like inverting the sort of hierarchy of of power something that i think is very typical of the kind of a neo-fascist right that kind of both have controlled power and sees itself in a in a sort of minoritarian position even the mainstream media now start taking our our line and then the minister in charge of the police says, well, the final proof that actually that was a terror attack and incited by the members of the Palestinian parliament, um, sorry, Palestinian members of the Israeli parliament, 
particularly the head of the Communist Party, um, is that, that the car drove with the lights off. Who drives them dead of night in the lights off towards police officers? Uh, of course, that is a terrorist. So we actually start scanning TV footage of the incidents and, and other things and start noticing, start highlighting all cars where we see the lights were on and kind of examining, is that, could that be actually the car that um, uh, that you know we're talking about um, even though this this videos were in the public domain one needs to learn how to see to see one needs to concentrate one needs to really work one needs to construct and one needs particularly speaking architecture because only by um, comparing within an architectural model uh, of the uh, uh, of the of the images, can you verify them? So, in some of the in some of the uh, steel frames, we saw two officers, two silhouettes of two people against that vehicle, and we will and then see the, the vehicle goes on, and then there's two other silhouettes. Now we have a kind of uh, situation that we need architecture to uh, to to come to our help. Uh, we place the thermal imaging video on the terrain video, and we mark the location of people uh, that we could see uh, within the thermal image on our model. Then we can find the precise location where the uh, Al Jazeera video is taken from, uh, and we can actually verify that precisely those um, silhouettes would be seen. So therefore, we know that is the vehicle that actually participated in the, uh, the, the, the vehicle in question. That, that video by the Al Jazeera is simply used as a backdrop that nobody kind of noticed that bit within it. And what we could see is that the lights are on. So that makes the news and the police uh, version uh, is further demolished. Uh, but they say, no, we're going to continue um, with you know, demolishing this village. We're going to continue with all our action because even if we shot first and even if he was, he was going with the lights on, he has charged at the policeman. He accelerated the, 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 the tool of the terror attack is the gas pedal press the gas pedal. We don't have access to the car, but we reconstruct it in 3D and we mark all the bullet holes uh, within it. And then we undertake something that is also, again, unorthodox. We go to the village, these are uh, our friends, and together with our team and the villagers, we actually conduct a reenactment. Uh, we examine the site, uh, we reconstruct it through testimonies. Uh, we locate exactly where things are. Even Ayman Oda, the head of the Communist Party, comes to this uh, reenactment. And we want to see if by simply lifting the leg at the moment that the, um, that the car said, uh, you, you know, that the car started accelerating, even if you don't press the gas pedal, whether the car would accelerate uh, at the same speed. And um, we could see here is the aerial image. Here is our experiment. And just look, there is no gas being pressed on the pedal and the cars are moving precisely at the same speed, right? So we've taken the last kind of, um, the last thing that the, State was saying it was important. You would go like, "Why are you even bother uh, with them?" But as I showed, you know that that issue was about criminalizing uh, Palestinian politician, criminalizing the entire village, taking people's, uh, threatening to take people's uh, citizenship away from them, etc. And again, this was our uh, entry to the Turner Prize. Uh, so you would say, "Why is it so?" Well, because the exhibition at the Tate came with some budget that enabled us to do that work. Uh, and because we do not go to court usually in um, Israel, Palestine, 
uh, we need to find alternative forums to present cases uh, to show those things uh, and that was uh, important and then even though we were accused while we were at the Tate by a lot of pro-Israel uh, activists and Israeli uh, spokespeople of manipulating the evidence of this. Even the prime minister himself apologized, finally had to retract from that story. Uh, not that the apology uh, was very honest or well-meaning, but um, to a certain extent, we could show that you can invert uh, a state narrative, the entire apparatus of the police and political parties. So, but when when analyzing a split second incident, as I said, it is really important to locate it within the political machinations around it, and also within the long history of uh, dispossession uh, within that. So our claim that there is a long duration to a split second, that within the police shooting, what is revealed is the long history of colonization of apartheid, in these parts. Um, and uh, I'll show you uh, I'll show you another uh, study uh, that we've done on actually taking the same technique you've seen us you know using Al Jazeera's text, social media, activist videos and, and uncovering that. Now we are, we I'm going to show you how we look at at um, photographs that are you know 70 years old and proving that people, this is not the same village, it's a village next to it, um, was inhabiting that area. That the whole idea that Bedouins are nomads is a complete manipulation. So here is the, here is the, um, the study. We're looking at um, two things. One is the points on, on, the, on the land. Here are um, wells. So wells. And then we're looking at roots. Roots through the desert are, you know, registered very clearly. And roots are uh, a kind of a habit of uh, repetitive, repetitive walking, of repetitive moves uh, that connect those points within a sort of a cultural continuity. So it's the roots, the cultural habit that connects archaeological points that show a continuity uh, of inhabitation. Uh, so we were uh, doing that kind of study on a continuity of roots and showing that same people that live there now, that they say are squatters, uh, are um, a continuing same pattern of movement um, of um, you know, historical ones. And, um, so here are the points, here are the roots, here are the areas. And um, the state kind of arbitrarily cuts those lands and said, you need to prove ownership of these sort of like cropped up uh, pieces. Whereas what is important is to look at the continuity uh, of inhabitation uh, along the desert. And the, and the uh, aerial images that we were using are British Royal Air Force uh, photographs from 1945. So, you know, it's not only with kind of contemporary media, they in fact, uh, we could work. I don't know how long I still have and whether we should move to towards discussion. I have a few other investigations. Maybe I'll wait for UC to just. Yeah, you have still seven, eight minutes, so it's fine to call us. Okay, very good. Um, a, an investigation in Germany, uh, a racist killing of uh, uh, by a neo-Nazi uh, group called the Nationalist Socialist Underground, uh, targeting Germans from Turkish background. Uh, in this case, in Kassel, 2006, uh, the two murderers uh, enter. Uh, into an internet cafe and shoot Halit Yozgat, who mends the um, reception in it. Uh, much like many other racist killing, only that here said uh, a secret service agent of the German state. And therefore, the uh, question is, 
how the state is the state seeking to prevent it how is the state might be involved in that uh, the person um teme uh, was actually um escaped after the killing though he was in the in the in the internet cafe and then was asked to reconstruct how he could have left uh the cafe the internet cafe without um informing the authorities and without seeing the body um and he made a reenactment video and that's uh the police a police officer next to him and for us that video reenactment is itself not um uh, a kind of a representation of the crime the video is the crime the crime of perjury by which the state tries to kind of deflect from its responsibility uh, for this uh, killing. And when questions were asked, um, Hessen, the German state, where it happened, and put a 120 years embargo on this case. Um, we were actually working for, for a citizen tribunal called Unraveling the NSU Complex um, um, that was um, run by family members and activists. Uh, we um, collaborated with the House of World Cultures in Berlin and reconstructed a one-to-one -one model of the scene of the crime. Um, and we wanted Two, to shoot- was threaded with different sound suppressors to simulate the suppressor used in the crime. Yeah, we-, we, we The Colt 32 with a wet suppressor. Yeah, we actually recorded the sound. Two, was threaded with and different- then, an end played it the sound at pc2 measurement end yeah. measurement end yeah we can the sound at pc2 was clear there uh to show that the that the sound would have been audible that uh, secret service agent claiming that he hasn't heard the sound uh, was a lie so here we're not you know counter investigation we're not investigating the murder we're investigating the testimony of um, the Secret Service agent. We only investigate state agency, as I said before, because it's an internet cafe. Each one of the witnesses was logged in and we had a kind of uh, entire choreography that we could have reconstructed uh, with actors uh, using the video of uh, the reconstruction itself to reconstruct both the event and to reconstruct the reconstruction, right? The reconstruction with Andreas Temer here uh, is there uh, to deflect responsibility. So we reconstruct the reconstruction and um, uh, show that um, uh, it is impossible. Andreas Temer claimed that he did not. Particularly, particularly, here is how Temer in the reconstruction is showing, look, I, I was looking for the person. He's just, you know, he just witnessed his killing. I don't know where he is, never heard anything, never seen anything, didn't smell the gunpowder. Then he puts a coin on the desk uh, of that person. And we could show that the body would have been clearly within his uh, line of sight. Um, so these kind of reconstructions are extremely, uh, important. Uh, again, the presentation was done not in a context of a legal uh, case, but in a context of a citizen tribunal. Here is a photograph from the citizen tribunal. And this is us presenting it. And then it was shown at the documenta uh, in a small space. But strangely, you started having police officers coming to see an art piece about police work, uh, which is kind of a strange inversion. Uh, then came parliamentarians um, and uh, from the Green Party, from the Socialist Party, from um, uh, the uh, Linke, the Left Party, and call this as evidence to the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry that investigated the uh, abuse of power by the Secret Service. So while the art world, the art critic said, this is not an artwork. This is evidence, strange, no title. The um, in the, the our detractors in the parliamentary commission of inquiry said, this is not evidence. This is an artwork, right? So you see, you have a kind of a slippage across. For and here you have Andreas Temme, uh, the secret service agent himself, 
called to watch our video in a parliamentary commission of inquiry. Again, a kind of like an inversion of art and law and politics. Uh, here is uh, our diagram of the way that was produced. And um, I'm going to end uh, now before telling you uh, about what we did at the Whitney, but I could come to that in questions if you like. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Ayo. Uh, we have going to have a, about 10 minutes break before going to discussion with you and Pasa. Uh, so we will start again at 10 past 2. Finish time, it would be probably many of you 10 past 1. Uh, 10 past 1 or 12 in, in UK or Central European time. So see you again in 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay.
Yeah, welcome back to back to the IELTS talk, uh, forensic architecture and their practice. Um, thanks a lot uh, for the talk. And now we will have a conversation with, between Bas with Bassam and Paroni and Ayel, and then some possibility you have uh, address some questions for the, for the audience to afterward. Bassam, you can go now. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Eyal, uh, for a fantastic uh, lecture and presentation, as usual. Um, perhaps I just want to touch on uh, probably one of the major um, themes that you uh, very nicely elaborated on, which we might call kind of the distributed space of knowledge uh or uh, media uh, today how the uh how uh to truly get to the core of uh something and in one way in previous talks you've called you've uh, uh called this uh a mode of confrontation uh or the way to confront uh post-truth statements like the ones uh, made in, in the uh, Umm al Hayran uh, incident, for example, uh, by uh, the Israeli police, uh, is to um, construct uh, models from numerous sites, sources, and locations. And uh, it strikes me that this is actually um, in relationship to the last. Uh, comment or example that you showed where there was a uh, kind of um, um, some journalism that had issues with uh, uh, forensic architecture uh, being labeled as art. It strikes me that this methodology of understanding the distributed space of information, knowledge, media is uh, precisely the kind of um, uh, the the aesthetic operation uh, that I think uh, makes this transition uh, from a merely kind of language uh, kind of centered art or semiotic centered art to an action um, kind of centered art. Uh, if we still want to call it art, of course, that's a philosophical question, but, and I'm wondering uh, two things here. I mean, um, within this kind of framework, why do you think that there, there is still some kind of resistance to, uh, to the work of, uh, of people like yourself and forensic architecture um, towards this approach and understanding uh, and um, how would you engage with people who still are uh, skeptical about this approach? Awesome. This is this is a great uh, opening question and kind of brings us into much deeper infrastructural theoretical kind of uh, discussion about forensic architecture, about <clears throat> culture of media and truth of verification uh, today. Firstly, I would say the intellectual habit and the artistic habit, when it is faced with question of truth, is to reach out for a five kilo hammer and smash it. Of course, you know, I come myself from the very same, you know, critical theory attitude of uh, uh, it is not really truth, capital T, that, that we need because, uh, you know, the understanding of epistemology is power, i.e. the kind of who has the right to establish truth, reinforces the authority of states, of um, judiciaries, sometimes even universities, okay? I mean, I'm saying that as an academic to an academic, so, you know, it's with our own uh, 
you know, healthy measure of self-criticism. Um, though I think that our relation to truth here is a bit more complicated than that. Uh, though it's not always appreciated within the art world that we are both deconstructing and constructing. We're deconstructing, we are very sensitive to the way in which statement, government statement about truth are articulated in language, in image, uh, you know, in, in, in on the ground, in action. And we, you need to, you know, you need to reach out for your entire kind of uh, deconstruct post-structuralist toolbox in order to engage with, you know, that sort of power knowledge nexus of states. However, you need to construct something else. And here also, um, critical education in the humanities, in art, in curatorial studies, visual literacy, visual cultures, uh, allows you to build something else. So we're not really speaking about positivism of old. We're speaking about a very entangled and complex relation to truth, while we both deconstruct and construct something else. Rather than truth or veritas as the kind of transcendent uh, power knowledge nexus, we call our practice open verification, meaning come from the same source, from the same veritas, but it's an imminent practice. It's contingent, it's collective. Uh, and we facing that kind of uh, political epistemological crisis, political epistemology of fascism, the political epistemology of neocolonialism, you know, that smashes the ground and people in it and smashes the truth about what happens. You know, it would be easiest to just say, let's prop up the big custodians of truth. You know, like in the US with Trump, no, let's, we need to insist on reinforcing the New York Times, the Washington Post, you know, even the FBI would save us from that monster. Uh, frankly, they don't and they won't. And we need to accept the challenge to the collapse of institutional truth. And we need to build another thing instead. And here, you know, I connect to kind of conversations that we had, Bas and no, but the curatorial practice as the production of knowledge, something that you, you know, I, I know you were from curatorial knowledge and also Irit was uh, teaching in, in Helsinki at some point. So I think people are maybe aware of that line of thinking in which, you know, knowledge production occurs in a kind of a much more contingent, chaotic way between art spaces and scientists and artists and filmmakers and activists on the ground. And of course, always led by the people at the forefront of resistance to neocolonial practices. Uh, so that grid or that matrix of, of practices is that kind of new type of uh, truth practices, if you like, of open verification that involve at the same in the same way, an art gallery and a, and a scientific laboratory. And we want to completely, not to say, you know, let the art, let the science have monopoly of truth and, and the art of critique. We want to say, well, let's bring it complete. Let's create a, a, a knot, a very different relation uh, that would uh, make us vulnerable indeed, both in the art world to accusation of being, you know, kind of the art world is, you know, very fast throwing at you, you know, uh, positivist, you know, da, 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 you know, you need to complicate art. I mean, come on, you know, I mean, I've shown you a hundred times how we are able to critique the image and work with the image, you know, I mean, we're not scared of that critique, you know, it's like, it's a one-on-one, it's kind of critique one-on-one to condition of our work is critique of media and understanding of, of the uh, kind of manipulative capacity in media and text and words, et cetera, and the necessity to deconstruct it. Um, but the patient work of, of weaving together a kind of community of practice that create a commons um, as a metapolitical condition, 
is um, really important. And that brings together really kind of our sensibilities as aesthetic practitioners, a critical theorist in a much more direct way uh, with this action that you say. So, you know, it's action and it's theory, it's philosophy and it's deconstruction and it's architecture because we construct, it's all those things together. Uh, that it just wired up in a different way. Yes, thank you, uh, Eyal. Um, can I uh, ask you about your recent uh, book with uh, Matthew Fuller, uh, which is titled Investigative uh, Aesthetics, Conflicts and Commons in the Politics of Truth. Um, in the book, you, you define investigative, investigative aesthetics as the mobilization of sensibilities associated with art, architecture, and other such practices in order to speak to truth. Um, this mobilization of sensibilities, do you think, um, what you were just saying, um, obviously it's, it's uh, your, your uh, the kind of the, the, your recent track record of, of doing this and is, is uh, very uh, clear, but do you think um, in the book you, you touch on other practices, is it something that uh, do you think is catching on within the uh, expanded field or um, uh, is it still something that people are reluctant to do? Look, I think I think that um, obviously the the, the the discourse practice uh, in some parts of the uh, academia, um, you know, sort of critical theory, art nexus is is transforming, and you know, a lot of the things that uh, emerged out of our both our extended groups at Goldsmiths, you no, know, are kind of um, you know becoming more prominent, a lot of, you know, the PhD students that worked with me are themselves um, um, operating in this sort of gray area between aesthetics and investigations. Um, you know, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, one good example, but there are many other, obviously the great work of Susan Shukli uh, is another, uh, the work of Charles and Lorenzo uh, on, on the ocean. Uh, is also breaking ground, Paolo Tavares on forest. Uh, so there is, I, I feel that not only our group, but there's, you know, then there are other people that, that are within that domain and also people that inspire our work. Um, Trevor Paglen, you know, uh, the late, great um, Harun Faroqi, et cetera. So I think that there is, uh, I think that we are finding now a necessity to bring those two houses together, no, the kind of scientific and aesthetic in a way that, it, you know, the, it, at the meeting point is not only artists kind of like asking questions of science, problematizing science, but actually contributing together to investigation. And investigations as an organizing device in the humanities and academia is producing new methods of work and new epistemologies uh, to a great extent, um, they are occupying what Matt Fuller and I think is, um, is starting to occupy the place of critique, no investigation, try to occupy the place of critique in, um, in, you know, within the sort of the humanities. It's a very different thing, investigation, both in it, it's not replacing, it's not rejecting it it integrates it and moves forward uh, from critique. So it is, yeah, destroying and constructing at the same time. No, I mean, you need to, you need to destroy government lies, neocolonial lies, and you need to find a way the truth practices become social practices, become way of socializing evidence, become way of integrating dispersed communities around the leadership of people on the ground. And um, that is what is important. You create communities uh, of that are there to describe the world around themselves. 
And that description is essential because that's the commons, just like the commons is a lake or, you know, or forest or something or air. Um, you know, that process of always elastic, always shifting verification provide a kind of metapolitical condition. Um, perfect. Uh, this is uh, really <laughs> enlightening. I, I just, my last question before I uh, open up to some of the questions from uh, the audience, uh, it really resonated with me when you were uh, talking about um, uh, the the long duration uh, and uh, to a split second. Um, I thought you know that conjured up so many um, beautiful and second images, um, but it also I I saw it as a I kind of related it to to. Uh, to the question of uh, a the question of kind of like prediction in a sense, like uh, in in that split split second, uh, how do you um, how do you uh, think about the, or or kind of engage with this idea of a long duration where does it arise is it because is does it come from prior knowledge or does it come from uh prior knowledge that kind of enables you to predict that there might be something suspicious or might be something uh, not quite right about the narrative that's being uh propagated um how do you how do you find that kind of combination between uh, an incident uh, that happened in a specific duration with a specific duration at a specific moment and the turning and its turning point that relates to its a, a kind of long contextualized history. Sorry, I was speaking to muted mic uh, uh, in a risk of, uh, you know, self of promoting one one new other book I see that UC is kind of like uh, putting uh, our books on links. You see, maybe you can find it on the ICA website. This is a book that we've written exactly on that, on the long duration of the split second. It's uh, the police shooting of Mark Duggan, perhaps one of the um, most important of police murders in this country. Um, the police argued it as a split second. Uh, we showed that the police did not, that the Mark Duggan did not hold a gun in his hand when unlike, unlike what the police officer that shot him said, he said he held a gun. We showed, we analyzed it, we showed he couldn't have held a gun in his hand. But still, the police officer was not convicted. That was before we investigated, was not convicted, was not charged. Because the jury imagined that it would be reasonable for him in a split second to imagine that a black body, a black man facing him would hold a gun in his hand. Now, that is really where it is beginning. Why is it reasonable? Why could a police, why could a jury assume that it's reasonable for a police officer to imagine that the black person holds a gun in his hand? So it's an instinct, you know, it's a split second. A split second is also been described by that police officer like a freeze shot in cinema. So there's a cinematic imagination in a split second. But that time includes all times because at the split second, and every time you hear split second, a racialized person is dead. I, I give, I, 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 you know, I challenge you. Put Google police in split second. You'll see a lot of cases. There's always the person has not shot, and that person is racialized, and that person is dead. <laughs> That's when it's used. It's the most lethal time designation if you're a racialized uh, person. Because it is based on the imagination of the police officer or what you will have done if he hasn't shot you. Right. So to imagine what you could, what you would do, he's mining or she's mining the police officer that shoots the long history of racial relations, right? The fear 
of racialized people or the violence to which they are subjected to, right? At that moment of a split second, a deck of card opens. But that person is reaching for his license or his ID. That person is reaching for a gun. That person is reaching for a con. Why do you think that that, that in that particular situation facing with a racialized person is reaching for a gun? Then in that moment, the weight of history weighs on a split second. And then on the other hand, our investigation of the split second is always to connect it back to history because the police would always say, you need to look at the split second is itself. It's a space of exception. Nothing that happened before matters. Nothing that happened after matters. It's a kind of, it's the temporal equivalent of the space of exception of the camp, if you like, of a gambit, no? of space in which killing is not murder. It operates in time. And uh, then you, our aim is always to tie that split second into the long history, to reject police epistemologies of like always cutting that incident only to itself and say, no, we need to open the threads and connect that split second to the world of which it is part, right? That is the task. It's a difficult task. It's not easy. If you, if you look at a killing in Umm al-Hiran, you need to connect it to the long history of colonization in the desert, of Zionist settlements in the desert, of racialization and apartheid within that uh, towards the Palestinian Bedouin population, etc. So yes, it's it's complicated, but it's it's a necessity. So whereas um, micro histories came to kind of replace the sort of Marxist long durational history, micro history of the Italian school in the 70s and 80s, Carlo Ginzburg and others came to protest the sort of unembodied history of the anal school, say, and say, well, we need to look at lives of people, of simple people within that. I think that we are looking at molecular history, but at the same time, connecting molecular history to the long duration. So you have a kind of a very strange temporal continue discontinuity. Thank you, Eyal. Um, I'm, um... I'm, I'm going to uh, perhaps uh, just uh, pick a few questions. It's going to be very difficult. There are so many questions um, uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the chat. Um, there's a question from uh, Sasha Huber, um, and she's asking. I'd like to ask concerning the Grenfell Tower case in London and what they think about the decision about taking the tower down now, uh, as it was just decided without talking to the community of those who lost dear ones. Since uh, forensic architecture, of course, investigated this case. We're still investigating this case. We are, we now, we're working for the bereaved and um, survivors and Given that there is uh, little that I want to say at this point uh, publicly, um, but I want to say that um, such decisions about public memory are essential to be taken together with the community. And I find it a bit bizarre that decisions about safety Whereas all that issue was about safety, risking people that were inside. Now that there are no people inside, public memory is compromised for safety. There is There are ways to prop up structures. Uh, we have propped up churches. We propped up historical buildings. Where there is a will, there is a way. Um, another question from uh, Tarek Suleiman. Uh, 
asks, does choosing a case to investigate rely preliminarily on having enough evidence, footage, etc.? Um, are there different parameters when it comes to the Palestine-Israel context particularly? Excuse me, you'd have to repeat that, it got... Um, he's asking, does choosing a case to investigate rely on having enough evidence, footage, etc.? Uh, yeah, yeah, et yeah. yeah. Are there different par parameters when it comes to the Palestine-Israel context in particular? Yeah, I mean, Israel-Palestine, as I said, it's where I, it's the kind of political reality I grew in and from. Uh, and forensic architecture has kind of evolved its techniques and technologies from that conflict, you know, to cases worldwide. We work now in 35 countries, uh, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes the absence of evidence is evidence in its own right. Okay, that might sound a bit, you know, kind of uh, tautological. Uh, so obviously we, you know, if you have a video, you can look at what the video shows. If you don't have a video, you ask, why don't you have a video? And then we would we would investigate the denial of speech, the denial of evidence. Uh, has this area suffered internet interruption? Uh, has there been a ban on things? Has has evidence been seized? So you you know the minute that there's no evidence, you go up another question: why there's no evidence? And very often, when you investigate state, uh, what we are following is the cover up rather than the story itself. So, you know, we've investigated cases where there was no evidence at all. We had no access to the Syrian prison of Sadnaya. We had no access. Uh, there were no videos of it. Uh, there were only four survivors who would speak to us, and we reconstructed it from their memory. Um, it, the, you need to calibrate the question to the evidence. That's true. Sometimes, you know, we could say, well, sorry, there's really nothing we could do here. And um, it's obvious that there are cases like that, but there's not, it's not condition, sorry, on having a situation that is recorded from all sides. The murder of McDuggan that we investigated, there were no videos at all. There was piles and piles and piles of paperwork, thousands of pages of testimonies of police officers describing the incidents as if they shoot videos, like as if they are, you know, recording a video into the hard drive of their brain. But then, of course, we could see that the testimony don't work, don't add up. So that's the, that was the investigation. Last question. A question from uh, from uh, Ero Elvakuri: uh, Does intuition have a role in the in investigation? Can intuition help in establishing just societies? I mean, it's a good question. I I don't exactly know what intuition is, frankly. I I don't know. It could be it could be referring to different things, to kind of like learned habits. Uh, to experience. Um, uh, I, I prefer to refer to imagination and to say something like that. You know, we imagine that truth is simple. Truth is simply just lying there. You pick it up. To lie is to create a complicated structure, fiction, and, you know, uh, feature film, book, a novel, etc. Truth is easy, lies complicated. I want to invert that. Oh, I, I, you know, I have nothing about the complication of, of novels, of course, with full respect. But to say to come up with a truth, you need to invent. You don't invent the truth. You invent ways of combining evidence. You need imagination. You need aesthetics. You need to learn. You need to open up to the speech of and to understanding a situation from the perspective of, of the people that live there. It's an act of composition. It's an aesthetic act. It's an architectural act. Um, it is an act of imagination. 
fantastic answer. Um, a question from Martin Bourne. How do you believe one would be able to ensure the integrity, traceability, immutability of these investigations as they themselves get mediatized? Um, uh, it's a good question. I, I cannot guarantee anything uh, in, 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 in any field. It's always a struggle. It's a struggle to get it believed. It's a struggle to get it admitted. It's a struggle to get it broadcasted. It's a struggle to get it into court. It's a struggle to critique the court and put it outside. I mean, things are, you know, continuously unstable, in flux, in conflict, etc. Uh, you need to evidence need a lot of help. Evidence need to be propped up. Evidence need the social. Uh, matrix that actually mobilize that you know an evidence that in court is proving something is meaningless without the political movement without the social movement that mobilizes it towards its towards an end otherwise it just becomes a kind of a technical bureaucratic uh, contribution evidence needs social support let's say it like that Uh, a question from uh, Sasha Onas, uh, sorry, Susanna Onas. Um, are you engaging with uh, teaching these skills, tools, technologies, as they could be considered useful citizen skills? Would you see, uh, see widespread of such, skill, such skills as a challenge? Yeah, absolutely. We want to grow not as an office, but as a field. Uh, it's a very different thing, no? I mean, obviously, you know, um, you know, my <laughs> my worry every morning is how do I pay my team? Um, the uh, to grow as a field is to grow as a kind of um, as a non centralized kind of like knowledge sharing. Um, environment. So very much we want to, as we grow, we dematerialize. So the edges become fluffy. Now we are at the process of establishing in Ramallah, uh, within Al-Haq, which is the largest and uh, oldest Palestinian human rights group, a forensic architecture unit. Uh, we actually just advertising for it. So if anyone thinks they have the sensibility and skill, please apply and want to move to Ramallah, please do that. Um, we are starting something in Lebanon. We're starting, uh, we have a new office in Berlin. Uh, we have affiliated uh, offices in, in France dealing with police violence and in Brazil. So, you know, we want to grow in a way that is not centralized. Uh, we want to grow as a field uh, of action that mobilizes critical aesthetic and scientific sensibilities for political aim. Thank you very much, Eyal. Um, I think at this point, uh, I'd like to ask if anybody in the audience present would like to ask uh, a question via their own microphone instead of writing in the chat. Please feel free to do so. No? Any further questions? There's one question from uh, Heather Leibarger. Um, have you ever felt a threat to your own safety or that of other people working on the project's investigations with you? I guess everyone working in politics and human rights, and I think, Basim, you could speak to that uh, yourself. Um, 
also uh, feels that uh, states are sometimes very predictable <laughs> in, in wanting to silence their critics. Uh, some more overtly, some less, some are more trying to hide their, the way they do it. Um, so that's, that's a given within political work, political organizing and human rights work. I don't feel that forensic architecture is, is more vulnerable to that than other political activists. In fact, you know, maybe primarily being based in London is offering some protection. Uh, we are, of course, targeted di digitally. Uh, some of us are denied entry to different places. Uh, some of us are denied entry to Palestine. I, I'm an Israeli citizen. I can enter. I'm denied entry to, to the US. I don't travel to now to, to Russia. Uh, I'm advised not to travel to Turkey because of the, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, the world becomes more complex when you, uh, the more effective uh, maybe uh, you become. Um, what we need to protect are the people at the front line. Uh, witnesses that are vulnerable. Um, this is the main concern that we have, that people that would participate with us in investigation would not be exposed uh, to repression. And um, there are different digital and physical ways to, to, to deal with that. Uh, again, you know, we're not more expert in that than other groups. We have our own precaution uh, for the safety of, of um, investigators, etc., and participants. Um, a question from Fran Martinez. While a forensic architecture's practice is interdisciplinary as a field and in terms of research and dissemination, what's your relation to traditional academic disciplines? Um, interesting. I think that the nature of investigation um, need to reorganize the kind of skills or kind of disciplines, if you like, and expertise that are necessary. Uh, so, you know, an investigation like the one I showed you in Omel Khiran needs, um, you know, people that are car mechanics to understand about the vehicle. Uh, you don't want to work maybe with a curator about how the vehicle operates. Uh, but you want to work with a curator in this skill about how to organize the, uh, the community to participate, to engage, to produce the knowledge about the incidents and its meaning. Uh, you, when we do work in the ocean, uh, we need to work with meteorologists. Uh, I wouldn't ask uh, an architect to analyze for me the waves. Uh, so one needs to do that. The question is not so much the discipline, it's like how you wire them up and how you create a different uh, assemblage of knowledge coming from different perspectives. So I'm not an advocating on kind of flattening out the differences between disciplines. So, you know, experts are extremely useful, useful for us. I'm just saying they're not going to silence the direct witnesses of an incident, that they're different forms of knowledge that are operating in the same way. Just how you wire them up is matter. Um, rather than uh, who has more right to speak than others. It's not uh, really about that. It's about creating modes of, you know, bizarre collaborations, uh, I would say, around organizing question. And an organizing question of an investigation is so precise. What happened here, right? The, the most basic of question you all done, what happened? Hey, what happened? What happened? No, what happened needs to be answered through a kind of, sometimes a very simple question, need a very complicated answer. And a complicated answer is achieved through a very complex social creation of a community of practice in which different points of view morphs together. The more points of view, the more the poly perspectivity that you have, the more solid the act of verification you get to. And uh, is this poly perspectivity also something in the kind of the 
the objects of your uh, investigation or investigative research itself, because um, you have um, specific examples, for example, uh, in the uh, in the in the your research or forensic architectures research around uh, clouds, uh, for example, you mentioned cloud studies. Um, it's mentioned that uh, clouds are uh, meteorological and political events. And um, I'm wondering if this um, kind of uh, description uh, where um, it, it's very connected to what you're, uh, you were just saying um, um, in, in that any any object of research today is uh, kind of hyper complex uh, and it needs to kind of uh, be uh, studied uh, politically and uh, from its um, scientific kind of basis as well. So is that connected, do you think? Yeah, I think that uh, exactly like cloud studies is about a paradox of, you know, sort of like describing, representing clouds, that is a problem that plagued the history of art. Not plagued is a, is a bad word, no? That was consistent throughout the history of art. Clouds simply moved faster than a painter hand could capture them. They need to be imagined rather than described. So it's a very good entry point to understand forensic architecture. There's an act of imagination, there's an act of description, there's a tension between them. Uh, that need to be negotiated. The clouds, the political clouds that we're talking about is because long ago, the weather is no longer a natural event, but a political event in which an even distribution of toxins from around the world becomes an act of state and corporation from tear gas to environmental pollution to forest fires or the, the CO2 clouds of forest fires. But clouds are also interesting because there is there are two things at the same time their shape and their milieu they are you you're immersed in them they fracture your vision they, they blur your vision you're inside a cloud you cannot describe a cloud only from the outside you cannot understand tear gas if you haven't been in a tear gas cloud and understand that that cloud acts on your sensorium, on your nose, on your mouth, on your eyes, on your ears, in such a way that, you know, create this sort of hypesthesia, another term that I spoke about in, with Matt on, in a book. So, you know, it's all those things together. Um, uh, it's experience and it's mathematical simulation. It's political, um, it's optical, it's epistemological because the Cloud and blur is also a kind of a, the operation of, uh, you know, just like a tear gas on a central square or roundabout in a city, say, in the Arab world or in Palestine or wherever, is, is seeking to break the will of a public for protest. The it's a political, it's a political optical milieu. Uh, it is also an epistemological one. It's telling you this cloud never happened. It's there, but it's denied. Uh, and and I think that is exactly the kind of captures what forensic architecture is to a certain extent. Thank you. Eyal. Um, are there uh, any further questions from the audience, either in the chat or um, if you want to kind of speak to us by a microphone? It looks like we might be coming to the end. Yeah. You see? Yes. I think we run out of time anyway. 
Uh, so I will just wrap it up very quickly. Uh, thanks a lot for IO and uh, Passan uh, for this really nice co conversation, and a lot also for everyone who's been following and this um having these questions there's a lot of things to think about of course um and i also want to thank our partners once again uh Ikme Helsinki and Finnish Architecture Museum who's been really helpful to organize this with us um our what to say and and just going to remind you also for the audience Maria mentioned that uh, forensic architecture work is shown currently at the Finnish Architecture Museum we also have an um, exhibition, a group exhibition at the Vanta Art Museum, uh, where there's um, one work or one research from, from forensic architecture. Killing of uh, Zach Costopoulos is part of the exhibition called Secure Politics of Bodies and Space at the Vanta Art Museum currently. I'll just post the whole program link of, of this autumn program. You will find the information from there, all of these things. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, have and a thank to Yusi for connecting me to Bassem again after long. Yeah, great. I, yeah, it was, it was a was... wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> thank yeah, you I was I, I was guessing that there might be a, some you might pop bump into each other in the in the past somewhere. <laughs> might have, yeah. Thank yeah. you, Rose. Yeah, Fantastic yeah. to see you, you know, uh, yeah. and hear you, of course. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.